Well, this morning, we are, we are going to continue on a series called Marriage Games. I gave it a title. Aren't y'all happy? It's called Marriage Games. If you weren't here last week, we, we talked about games. And we all play games in our marriage uh, unintentionally uh, sometimes. And, and last week, we talked about operation. And how, you know, you remember the game of operation where you're the doctor and you've got to take everything that's wrong out of the patient. If you missed that message last week, we have a church YouTube page. So just type in Restoration Point Church. Uh, that sermon is posted online. Uh, so check that out, Marriage Games Operation. Today we're going to look at another marriage game. And I don't have a, a, a physical board game. I wish I did. I had this as a kid. I don't know what happened to it. One of my favorite games as a kid. Go ahead and throw it up there, Chandler. See if y'all remember this game. It was called Three Crosses. Y'all see it? We got that on there? Yep. Awesome. I thought somebody reacted. <laughs> How'd you see it on that one? How'd I see it on that one? That's all right. I can just tell the name of the game. The name of the game was Clue. Do y'all remember Clue? I loved Clue. It was one of my favorites. You've got to figure it out. For those who didn't play Clue, basically, I mean, it's kind of sadistic, I guess, because you're trying to, you know, you're a murder scene. You're a detective, which is good. Uh, but, but there's a, a murder scene, and you've got to figure out who did it, what they did it with, and which room they committed the murder in. And throughout the whole game, as you're gathering these clues, so you can hopefully put it together at the end and win the game. And so I love the game of Clue. And, and uh, we oftentimes in life give clues um, some of us more than, than others. I remember a story. My wife isn't here. I'm so glad she's down. I can just talk about her this morning and feel free to share all the examples I want to share about our marriage because she's not here. But I remember one time we were traveling home from a long trip, and I don't forget where or how long, but I remember uh, we're in the car, and she's and we're Starbucks is coming up, and she says, I, I sure would like to have a Starbucks. No, 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 she didn't say that. Let me back up. She says, a Starbucks sounds good right about now. That's what she said. <laughs> Starbucks sounds good right about now. To which I reply, well, do you want me to stop and get you a Starbucks? And she says, no, it's okay. It, you're probably tired. It's fine. So I say, okay. And I keep driving. I pass the Starbucks. And, 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 and then I realize, George, it was the wrong answer. Because she says, well, I thought you were going to... I was like, well, I asked you, and you said no. And I said, there's, there's another one right up here. Do you want me to stop at this one? She's like, no, it's okay. I said, oh, no. No. <laughs> Fool me once. Shame on you. Fool me twice. Shame on me. So I pulled in that one, and I got her a Starbucks. And, and I learned through 13 years of marriage that the women are really good at giving clues, right? As a matter of fact, they have so many clues, and us men often don't have a clue <laughs> And it makes you wonder, God, did you, when you were giving us these things, how come you didn't make it more proportional? How come you didn't give us an even number of clues? Because women have all the clues. And us guys, we really don't, just don't have too many clues. Uh, but sometimes us guys use clues. Um, there, there's a saying, you know, just say what you mean and, and mean what you say. Just come out and say it. But sometimes, we're not here to talk about clues, but we're here to talk about communication. And I got an analogy for you to kind of uh, lead us into where we're going. I like to wear black pants. Uh, there's a reason, well, what I'm going to share with you is not the reason I wear black pants, but, it, but that reason is, is a reason I'm glad I wear black pants. That makes no sense whatsoever. Let me just get to the analogy. You ever go into a restaurant, guys, you can relate to this, girls, you can just disregard this, you can fall asleep, whatever, you know, do whatever you need to do, file your nails. Um, guys, you can relate to this. You go into a restaurant and you need to wash your hands before dinner or lunch or whatever. And so you go up to the sink and you get soap all on your hands and, and you got your hands all lathered up with soap. And then you go to turn the water on. But when you turn the water on, this particular restaurant has the setting set to like hurricane force jet stream water. And as soon as you turn it on, water just shoots down like a, like a, a blunt force into the sink and, and a splatter effect <laughs> takes place. Now, I don't know how sinks are, are I, uh, uh, orchestrated in, in height, but, but in most cases, they're right around this level, okay? And as you can imagine, when that splatter effect takes place, it gets on a part of your clothing that you really didn't need it to get on a part of, especially if you're wearing khaki pants. Now, if you're wearing black pants, you ain't got to worry about it. You dust it off, you go on your way, nobody can tell. But when you're wearing khakis and that water splatters, you're in trouble, 
Now what am I going to do? You can't just walk out of the bathroom with water all on your pants looking like you peed on yourself. You can't do that. But at the same time, you're hungry and you can't just sit there and wait an hour for it to dry. Paper towels aren't doing the trick, so what do you do? You find the air dryer. <laughs> and then the guy walks in, right? Whoa, awkward situation. Why? Such an awkward situation when that dude walks in. But if, if it hadn't happened to him before, he's probably had it happen to him, so it's not that awkward. But, but there's a story to this because you see, you, there's a point, I'm, I'm saying this. You need the water. You want the water. You got soap on your hands. You desire the water. But as soon as the water comes out, and it, even though it's something you desire, the way it comes out causes you to detest it more than desire it. And I found in our life, we all want communication, don't we? We all want understanding in our relationships, whether it be a marriage or another relationship. That's not the problem. We desire to have that, but sometimes it's the way it comes out that causes us to really detest it uh, more than we desire it. So we have to watch the way it comes out. Turn to your neighbor and say, watch the way it comes out. Yeah, I'm going to have you talk to your neighbors a lot today just so y'all can hold each other accountable. Okay, y'all got to hold each other accountable. This morning, let's look at some appropriate ways uh, to communicate. Uh, before we get into the actual words and, and how to speak those words, Psalm 1914, David says, uh, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight today, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. David didn't just say, let the words of my mouth. He went a step further and said, let also the meditations of my heart. Uh, some people will say, it's okay to think it, just don't say it. I don't think that's very good advice. I don't think it's always okay to think it. You know, I, I think it's okay for the person on the other end if you think it and not say it, but it's not okay for you because if you think it, the Bible says in Matthew 15 that, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so just because you don't say it today, if you don't deal with that thought and deal with what's in the heart, then maybe tomorrow you might not have so much self-control. And you might end up saying uh, what you didn't say yesterday, and that opened up a whole new can of worms. So really, we have to deal with the heart. We have to deal with the thought process. It's not enough just to not say it. Let's just get the thought out of our mind when it gets there. So keep that in mind as we go uh, through these points. I have four points for you today if you're taking notes. The first point, if you're taking notes, go ahead and write this down. How do we, what are some effective ways that I can communicate with my spouse, that I can communicate with, with other relationships? The first thing you have to do is plan your response. Plan your response. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. It says, but I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. Every careless word. That word careless in the King James Version says idle. Uh, uh, another way of looking at it, it's a, it's a barren word. It's a lazy word. It's those words that you don't think about before they come out your mouth. It's those words that you just open up your mouth and bleh, spew it out. There's a phrase for that. It's a little crude, but, but I want to say it anyway. It's called diarrhea of the mouth. I don't know if y'all know anybody that has diarrhea of the mouth. Some people have constipation of the brain and diarrhea of the mouth, which is a dangerous combination to have both of those. Um, they need some emodium for that. But there's, there, there's this, you just open up and just, don't even think about what you're saying. It's a, a careless word. It's a lazy word that requires no thought, and it's dangerous. More, the more you talk is not always the better. You ever get yourself in a hole and you try to talk yourself out of it, and the more you talk, the digger, you're, you're digging that hole. You, you men are pleading the fifth. I see y'all all quiet, acting like you've never done it. Come on, let me ask your wife. Say, your husband ever dug a hole, he just couldn't get out of it. He tried to keep talking. Okay, that would be nice today. That's fine. You can't do it. More words ain't always better. Proverbs 10, 19 says, when words are many, sin is not absent. But he who holds his tongue is wise. More words is not the answer. It's better chosen words. Better selected words. Let's look at how Jesus handles this in John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, you'll see the, uh, the story of the, the woman who was caught in adultery. And the leaders, religious leaders, bring her to Jesus. They caught her in the act of adultery. They bring her to him and, and they ask him how they feel we need to respond to this. They said she was caught in adultery. The law of Moses said to stone her. Jesus, what do you say? And let's look at what verse 6 here says. It says they were trying, they were using this question as a trap. 
in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus did what? He said the first thing on his mind. No. He bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Go on to verse number 7. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Jesus didn't just say the first thing. I mean, you would think he could, right? You would think an all-knowing God, he would have the right thing to say. But he took time to stop right in the sand and think about what he was going to say. It's okay for you and I to think about it. Turn to your neighbor and say, plan your words. Plan your words. They were trying to trap Jesus. And can I tell you that there are some people in your life that are going to try to trap you. There are some people in your life that are going to say things to you just to see how you'll respond. It's a setup. It's a trick. Don't fall victim to it. Don't fall into the trap of just speaking the first thing on your mind. Because sometimes the worst thing you can say is the first thing on your mind. It's the worst thing that you can say. Let's bring this back around to marriage. You know, there have been times uh, in, in, in our marriage when Valerie has made comments and, and she's bringing something to my attention and I really don't respond to her. I don't know if any, any of you guys have been there before. I really don't respond to her. And she says, how come you aren't saying anything? And, and every now and then, you know what I say? I say, because what's on my mind doesn't need to come out of my mouth, both for your benefit and for my benefit. And you just got to be honest. Right? How come you don't say anything? Because I'm kind of like a quarterback. If you watch football, let me tell you what a quarterback's role is. A quarterback has different receivers on a pass play. He has his wide outs. He has his tight end. His running back can even roam around and be a receiver. But, but on every play, he has a primary target. It's, it's, it's that hot route. And so on every play, he's got that guy he's looking at. It might be this guy over here. Set up. He backs up. That's the first guy he's going to look at. If he's covered, he goes through what they call a progression. Okay, if he's covered, let's go to my, my second choice. Okay, he's covered, let's go to my third choice. And you'll see when they're going through there, and they're going through their, their, their progression, you can see it in their eyes and the way they move. And that's how I am sometimes. My wife will make a comment, and the first thing on my mind, no, that's covered up. I better not, I better not throw that one. Second, no, I better not throw that. And that's why it takes so long for me to respond. I wish she was in here and I could tell her. But I, that's why it takes so long for me to respond is because I'm going through my progression. And ain't none of those receivers open. And I'm just trying to find where I can get rid of this ball, but I, it ain't going to be gotten rid of in a good manner. If, and so I'm silent. And, and, but that's okay for a moment. Let's not remain silent. we got to find the right answer. But we have to plan the words. We have to think about it. It's kind of like chess. Anybody play chess in here? Anybody know the rules of chess? A few of y'all know the rules of chess. Okay. For those who don't know the rules of chess, it's a lot different than checkers. <laughs> it's a lot different. Every player has it. Some players can only move diagonal. Some pieces can only move in an L shape. Some pieces can only move horizontal and, and, and are vertical and horizontal. Some can only move one step at a time. It's, it's a totally different game. But here's how you lose at chess. You lose at chess like this. Let's say you, your opponent makes a move that's going to take your knight. And you're like, oh, that's all you see is that move. And you go on the defensive. I'm going to protect my knight. And you move somebody over there to protect your knight. Well, in doing so, if you're not careful, you'll open up your queen to get taken, which is a much more valuable piece than your knight is. And that's how it is in our life sometimes. When we go on the defensive, when our spouse or that relationship, person you're in a relationship with, when they say something that kind of stings and kind of hurts, and immediately, without even looking at the board, we just want to go on the defense. But sometimes when we go on the defense, we leave other areas that are more valuable in our lives open and vulnerable and, and, and exposed to being taken. And so that's not always the best way to win a game of chess and it's not always the best way to communicate. A better way to do it, and a good chess player will do this. As soon as you make your move, if I'm a good chess player, I'm gonna see, I'm gonna look at the board. I'm gonna say, okay, I can move right here. But if I move right here, what can I anticipate their next move to be? Okay, they might move right here. And then if they move right here, then I would move right here. And then what would they... It's not just thinking the next move, but it's thinking three moves ahead of them. That's how you win at chess. You've got to be thinking three moves ahead. And that's how we have to be in our relationships as well when we're dealing with those crucial moments when things get a little confrontational in our communication. We have to stop, look at the whole board, and say, if I make this move, if I say these words, what will happen? What will happen? 
we have to ask ourselves that question. What will happen if I say that? How will, how will those words be perceived to that person? What kind of collateral damage can I expect to, to receive out of those words? We have to ask those questions before we just let them come out of our mouth. We have to plan our words. Proverbs 13, 3 says, He who guards his lips guards his life. But he who speaks rashly will come to ruin. We've got to have a guard at the gate of our lips before we ever say a word. Plan your words. Especially when things get heated. Especially when that person comes to you with fire. Have you ever seen anybody put out a fire with fire? But yet we try it every day in our conversations, don't we? We try it every day when those hot words come. We just respond with hot words. Uh, Proverbs 15.1 tells us that a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word will stir up anger. I had one pastor share it like this with me. He said, with every conflict that you have, it's, it's a fire you've got to put out, right? Like with your conversations, there are certain fires that people come at you you've got to put out. And you have, on one hand, you have a bucket of water. And on the other hand, you got a bucket of gasoline. And it's really up to you. Your response is up to you. Their response is not up to you because people respond how they want to respond, don't they? But your response is up to you. Now, you can throw the water on there and give them a gentle answer that's going to turn away that wrath and put out that fire. Or you can just fire right back at them, throw gasoline on them. But we all know the results of that. I think we may have been in a couple of those situations. So it's the gentle answers. It's planning our words that's going to help us become a better communicators. Uh, with our spouse. The second thing, if you're taking notes this morning, that we need to do in our communication is we need to preserve your relationships. Preserve your relationships. Colossians chapter 4, verse 6 says, Let your conversation always be full of grace, be seasoned with salt, so you may know how to answer everyone. Y'all you know salt is a preserver. It's a preservative. It preserves things. I find it interesting that Colossians tells us to, that let our conversation be seasoned with salt. I take that as saying let it be, let it have preservation value. Don't let it be words that tear down, but words that protect that relationship and preserve that relationship. And I'm going to dig deep into to our life, my wife and I's life, and share uh, and again, she's not here, so it's, it's, it's great because it's about her. And, and she's like the, the, the what, what not to say and then what to say. I'm going to give y'all what not to say and then I'm going to give y'all what to say. Y'all ready for this? And so Mackenzie has this loft bed when we moved that, that we had to put in a different room. But I had to take it apart to put it in a different room. And it was sitting there in different pieces. And, and I just didn't feel confident enough in my ability to do that solo. And so he just sat there in a the corner. And they kept hounding me, Valerie and Mackenzie, when you move up a bed up, when you move up a bed up, when you move up a bed up. And so finally one night, you know, it was getting about bedtime. And I said, I'm going to be a good father. Uh, I'm going to surprise them. And I'm going to put this bed up by myself because I don't, I'm not comfortable because it's heavy and i got to angle it. And it's just, it, it wasn't the ideal situation. But I was willing to, to put in the extra effort to get this done for them, right? So I do it. And I put the bed up. And, you know, I got to admit, I made a few mistakes, okay? I made a few minor mistakes, but, but the bell was up, and it was functional, and I tested it out, and, and I didn't fall through, so that was a good thing. And, and so I, you know, it was tested and approved by 180 pounds, so it was good for her little, you know, 50-pound frame. She's probably more than that. I don't know how much she weighs. But anyways, McKenzie's, McKenzie's excited. She comes, no, 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 like the, the nine-year-old girl does. Valerie comes in, and she kind of has... That smile, like like everything ain't right with the world, right? That smile is kind of like, mm, um, and the first thing she says, oh, okay, um, well, why is this piece right here not painted? Why, why is the, the bare board showing on this piece? And, and I was like, well, I mean, I, I put it on backwards. I mean, you know what? <laughs> but by that time, it's too late. I mean, I got it up. I can't just take it off. I and mean, we can paint it. That's why I told her, we, we can find some paint, paint. No, no big deal. And then she said, well, how come this... This other piece on the other side, the, the side rail, I could one up and it's missing. I couldn't get it in there. I couldn't wedge it in there right. And it, it just wouldn't fit. It just, the way that, I guess I put it together, together crooked. So that last piece just wouldn't go in. But it's okay. She doesn't need that. It's got another rail. She's not going to fall out. It's, you don't need two rails. You just need one. So I had one, so I thought I was good. And, and then she's like, what about the steps leading up to it? Are they not screwed in? And finally, I was like, you know what? I just spent time and effort. 
effort to put this together and you just name three things that's wrong with it. And any man in the house can understand my frustration at this moment saying, I worked hard on this. And, and all you do is see the wrong in it. Three things. And I got a little frustrated that night at her communication. Okay, that was what not to say to a man when he's worked hard, okay? Now let me tell you what to say. Because it was a, a little while later, we have this, um, our washing machine is a, is a top loader. But there was a shelf that it goes into. Apparently they had a front loader first. So, so, so when you push it in there, and it's under this, this shelf, it doesn't open all the way. And you got to kind of prop it open and dig your hand out. It's like trying to find candy in the bottom of a jar. You know, you got to dig your hand in there to get the clothes out. And so it wasn't very easy to do. But once we closed my house, the first thing I did was to cut a hole in that cabinet, a little roundabout area to, to fix that. And, you know, I was excited about that. I bought this little cheap saw, jigsaw at Walmart, and I was excited that I was going to cut something. It's like Tim, Tim the Tool Man Taylor. Oh, 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 oh. You know, I was excited. I had power tools in my hand. She says, honey, are you sure you know how to do this? It's like, it's okay. And whether I know it or not, it's going to be fun, right? And I did it. And, and she wasn't really around when I did it. But later that night when the kids are in bed and she opens up the laundry room doors, the words out of her mouth were, thank you for that, honey. You did a great job. Oh, right? <laughs> At that moment, she could have then went into but could you do this? And I, I would have been fine with it. She could have then went into whatever was wrong with it, and I would have been fine with it. You know why? Because she appreciated me first. She appreciated me first. And I think that's a key in our relationships, is we can give correction, but let's give appreciation before we give correction. There, there's a process for that. There was a friend of mine who had, at a job I had, uh, order entry, he was, we had this checking process. For the new employees, we just didn't trust whatever they keyed to the system. We had to check their orders. The older employees, are not older, but more experienced, would, would check their orders. And we would get tickled at this friend because of his style of, of checking and, and how he would present it uh, to these younger workers. Is, is he would come in and he would say, you know, you did great and everything, everything's great on here, but there's just a few things I just want to point out. And he was always so gracious. That joker could have... The, the, the new employee could have jacked up that entire order and just entered everything wrong. But he was still going to be, well, you're doing a great job, and you're just, you know, you're, you're doing good, you're learning, you're improving. You're, he was always going to be positive first before he went in to what the issues were and what needed to be corrected. And I think we can learn something from that in our communication. There again, appreciation before correction. We look at this in, in Jesus in Luke chapter 9. Verse 46, he, he models this because I don't believe Jesus, I believe Jesus uh, corrected, but he never rejected. I don't think he rejected them. Well, not, not when it comes to his disciples. He corrected them instead of rejecting them as individuals. In Luke chapter 9, we see the disciples arguing. In verse 46, his disciples began arguing. Uh, argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. And let's see what Jesus says in verse 47. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand behind him. In verse 48, he said, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is least among you who will be the greatest. What a way to deal with that situation. I don't know that I would have had the grace that Jesus would have had. Because sometimes my kids get to argue over little things. And they get to argue over what they're going to watch on TV. I want the remote. No, I want the remote. And as a parent, if they're arguing over that, you know what I do? Ain't none of y'all gonna get the remote. Y'all can't agree on what to watch? I'm gonna hold it. Y'all stop arguing over petty stuff and I just take away the remote. But Jesus didn't come to them when they started saying, I'm gonna be the greatest. No, I'm gonna be the greatest. He said, he didn't come to them and say, neither one of y'all gonna be the greatest. Y'all lucky if y'all even make it to heaven the way y'all acting right now. That's what I always say. That's what I always say. Y'all keep on. I'm gonna replace y'all with some other disciples arguing over foolish stuff. But he didn't say that. He didn't reject them even though they were acting childish. He correct, he appreciated, and he taught them a lesson with gentleness by bringing up this child and gently correcting uh, their behavior. Same way it is in our life. We have to preserve the relationships. Let's gently correct. Let's keep that in our mind uh, as we're dealing with those things. Appreciate before we, we give correction. The third point, uh, I don't know if y'all noticed the theme that I got going on here. 
plan your response, preserve your relationship. Y'all see what I did there? Y'all see that P and that R? Yeah, y'all ready for the third one? Because they don't have a P, R, and R. I, I tried, I tried, I, I, I was looking up the SARS.com, trying to find some synonyms. I do that, that's a little secret, y'all. I, I just let the cat out of the bag. Sometimes in my messages, I try to, to, to plan things like that, and, and I couldn't find anything. And I'm spending a lot of time on that. And finally, the Holy Spirit said, what are you doing? Why are you wasting your time trying to find words that match? I haven't called you. Your words ain't got to be cute. They got to be anointed. That's the difference. You ain't got to be cute. Aren't you glad you ain't got to be cute to be called? Yeah. I would tell you to tell your neighbor that, but I don't want y'all to offend my body. <laughs> they might think you're calling them ugly. Uh, so, so, so when the Holy Spirit told me that, I said, okay, Holy Spirit, well, I'll just tell the people it was your fault when it doesn't. <laughs> so, 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 so for those of you who are like OCD and got to have everything, I forgive, forgive me for, 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 for missing this. But the third point, if you're taking notes, is, is this is don't jump to conclusions. Don't jump to conclusions. And your homework is to take that home and try to find a PNR, okay? <laughs> and bring it back next week. Don't jump to conclusions. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 13. It says, he listening, that is to his folly and his shame. You know, I heard someone once say, um, he who tries to jump to conclusions rarely lands on them. I thought that was pretty good. Somebody else took it on a more humorous note, and they said, don't you wish that jumping to conclusions and running your mouth was a form of exercise? <laughs> because then we'd have a lot more fit people in the world today, wouldn't we? Don't jump to conclusions, because what jumping to conclusions is, is it's an accusation. It's a, that's all it is. It's an accusation before you have all the facts. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 tells us that Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to take his job away from him. Uh, that's not a very good job to have. I want him. I don't want him to be the accuser, but he is. You know? let's, let's let him do that job. Let's not be accusers ourselves. Jesus there again in, in John chapter 9 uh, has to deal with this jumping to conclusions. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? Jumping to conclusions. Jesus, was it because of his sins or his parents' sins? You see how they did that? And Jesus is like, well, what happened to option C? Since when do you get to put the options on, on what's really going on. Like they have all the infinite knowledge in the world. They're going to try to narrow it down and jump to this conclusion that if this man has a, a illness and a sickness, if he is blind, then either he messed up or he's dealing with the mistakes of his parents. Which one is it, Jesus? And Jesus taught him a lesson and not jump into conclusions by saying this. It's not because of his sins or his parents' sins. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. Option C. The option you didn't think about. And oftentimes in our life, when we jump to conclusions, there again, we rarely land on them. And there's a lot of times we start accusing people of things because we only think it has to be for this reason or that reason, but we don't realize there's a whole other reason altogether that we're not even aware of. It's a dangerous thing to go down that road. A dangerous thing to <coughs> jump to conclusions. Before we have all the facts and before we have all the details. So in our relationships, going back to marriage, when, when, when that spouse looks like, when it looks like they, they're not doing something. For me, it's like mowing the yard. My wife is like, honey, you going to mow the yard? It's getting real tall. And little does she know I have a plan. Uh, you know, not in the middle of the day when it's hot. I'm going to do it later on this evening when it's cooler. But she's going to jump to conclusions and think I'm not going to do it at all. So you can't jump to conclusions. And I just realized that all these examples are on her. <laughs> I haven't shared with y'all all the things that I say. Uh, that's because just like the Bible says that the, the, these works of Jesus are not all he did because if you listen to all that he did, there is no book in the world that can contain it. That's kind of how it is with all the wrong things I say in our marriage. If you put all the wrong things I say in the marriage in a book, the, there's no book big enough in the world that can contain it. So therefore, I just live, get her limited mistakes instead of my infinite mistakes. <laughs> Wasn't that good? Yes, sir. Caleb, you can come on back up here, man. You can come on back up. I got one more point to cover. 
So plan your words. Preserve your relationships. Don't jump to conclusions. These are things that's going to help your marriage. And, and, and the last one's really going to help it too. The last one is Proverbs 17. Now, let's read the scripture before we share this last one. He who covers over an offense promotes love. But whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. The fourth thing we need to do is cover, don't smother. Cover, don't smother. Cover the issue, cover the offense, cover the sin, but don't keep bringing it up over and over again. You know, when I was growing up, we, we buried our, our animals in the backyard. And um, sometimes, a lot of times, we didn't mark where we buried them. And so I had no idea where they are. And, and you know, there's all kinds of animals. Now, there's big eyes, there's blackie, there's cocoa, there's peppermint. We weren't very creative with names, as you can tell. Uh, there's all these animals out there. And as a kid, sometimes you were just curious, you know. I just like to go dig up big eyes. It was my hamster that died. I just like to go dig him up, see if he's still there. <laughs> But I couldn't find where he was because we didn't mark the grave. Couldn't dig him up even if I wanted to dig him up. But sometimes in our relationships, I find that we put headstones on a lot of things. Well, we'll have an offense that we'll deal with, but we'll put a headstone there so we always remember where that offense was. It's a bad thing to do in relationships. Don't put a headstone there. Remove that headstone. You don't want to go back and dig that up. Once you've dealt with it, once you've addressed the offense, cover it up. Bury it. Never to return again. He who covers an offense acts out of love, but whoever repeats it will separate close friends. So you can turn to your neighbor for one final time and say, leave the past in the past. Leave the past in the past. Cover that thing up. Don't, don't keep smothering them. Say, remember that time? Remember that time? Oh. Let's not remember that time. Let's forget about that time. We dealt with that time. That time is over. That happened five years ago. That happened ten years ago. Let's not revisit that. Let's deal it, deal with it, and move on. Final scripture this morning is Proverbs 25, 11. It's just kind of recapping everything we've talked about. It says, a word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Now that, that scripture don't quite have the same impact on me as it does some of you guys. I don't care what you put the apples in. I mean, you might as well put the apples in a bag. It don't matter to me. But for, for, for those who like the look of things, this is King Solomon writing, so he was very prestigious. You know, that, was a, that was a big deal. You got gold apples in a silver basket, and boom, it's popping, right? And that's what words spoken at the right time, in the right way, will do. They'll be, they'll be a great centerpiece for our relationships. Y'all see how I tap that in? That apples of gold in a silver basket is a great centerpiece. And your words spoken aptly, spoken the right way, will be a great centerpiece in your relationship. So I hope that has helped you and encouraged you this morning. Uh, let's go to the Lord, uh, Lord in prayer. We'll have some time here at the altar. Father, we thank you for your word.